Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Uh, tonight's project is a uh, electronic or an electrical project. We've got a Casio um, model CTK650 keyboard. It's an older keyboard. I picked this up at a uh, yard sale or flea market uh, several years ago. And uh, kids wanted to mess around with it. And, you know, I didn't pay much for it, so I didn't see any harm in that. Worst thing is, if they break it, well, you know, not out a ton of money. So, problem is, uh, they haven't been able to uh, get it to turn on. Now, uh, this was working. I did have this working at one point. I think I had it working on a uh, on a universal AC adapter or DC adapter. So, um, the way these keyboards work is uh, most of these keyboards of this style, they they run off of DC, and uh, they're supplied with a uh, AC wall adapter and that's the black box that plugs into the outlet takes the 120 volts AC we we have here in the US uh, 60 cycles or 60 Hertz and it converts that into it actually first thing it does is it steps it down to a lower AC voltage then it rectifies it filters it and uh, sends that to the keyboard and actually the filtration I should uh, back up a second because the filtration I believe actually happens uh, inside the keyboard itself but the point is what's fed into the keyboard through this power plug is DC power and DC power has polarity positive and neg negative so on all of these little DC plugs like this uh, right below it there'll be a little symbol typically it'll say what the DC voltage is that's supposed to be provided and it will also tend to have a little symbol to indicate whether or not the center pin is positive or negative so a common problem that can happen on these is people will acquire one and uh, it didn't come with the AC adapter that you know is the, the original AC adapter or uh, maybe something happened to the AC adapter it got lost or damaged and they decide well they've got another AC adapter that plugs in there we'll just plug it in and uh, what's the big deal well they plug it in and it doesn't work and then they think well maybe that AC adapter is bad and in reality they may have just plugged in an AC adapter that actually is the wrong polarity and in doing so they may have actually damaged the keyboard so I'm wondering whether or not my little buddies here in the house got a hold of the wrong AC adapter and plugged it in because uh, all they did was tell me that dad hey it's not working anymore and um, they can't even find the AC adapter that they were using so what we're gonna do is we're gonna see whether or not if we supply the correct DC voltage and polarity to this thing if it will turn on which I kinda doubt because uh, I think the damage has already been done and if it doesn't turn on and we know that it's a problem internal to this. We're going to open it up and see if we can't figure out what exactly went wrong. Well, bear with me. It's upside down here, but I just wanted to make sure we got a good look at what I was talking about here with that little symbol. So this actually says DC voltage, and then you can see there's a little symbol. There's a plus and a minus in a circle, and they point to either the outer or the inner pin. So uh, the uh, that's going to tell you what the polarity is. All right, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to verify whether or not this is uh, actually the correct correct adapter for this situation um, so what you can do is you can take a voltmeter put it on DC volts hold the uh, negative lead to the outside and the positive lead to the inside if it measures positive voltage which it does in this case it means that the center is positive if it measures negative voltage then it means the outer casing is positive and the center pin is negative now you may have just noticed that my adapter said that the center was negative and yet it's reading differently and the reason why is because this splice right here this AC adapter I used for another project that I needed an AC adapter that had this size connector on it so I hacked off one of these from a bad adapter and spliced it onto these wires from this AC adapter and I just reversed the leads so I converted this to be a positive center 
so it's not going to work for my application here on this keyboard i got to find another one all right took some digging but i finally found a uh an adapter in my spare box of adapters that has the proper polarity that has the uh, negative the, the inside and the uh, outer jacket is positive so now if i hold the negative on the outside and the positive lead on the tip you'll notice that the reading i get on the voltmeter is negative 12 volts because in fact the outer jacket is the positive now i know i've got the right voltage and uh polarity now this adapter that i've got here is also I've got a third rating we need to be concerned about which would be the current rating that it's, it's capable of supplying so this is a uh, 10 watt 600 milliamp so 600 milliamps is 0.6 amps so this is capable of supplying um, consistently at that voltage 0.6 amps which is not a lot of power the power consumption on this unit may very well be higher than that so if for long-term use I'm going to want a beefier power supply for this but for the purposes of our testing and diagnosis we can we can get away with this now I'm going to plug this in just temporarily and try and power it up okay and nothing happens all right so now I'm going to unplug it right away I'm not going to leave it plugged in just in case there's a short inside here um, because that would definitely damage that power power adapter so now that we've figured out that we even with the correct power supply it's not powering up we've got to open it up before I take the cover off I just wanted to point out here on the back uh, there's a data label that actually uh, also gives us a little bit more information again we already knew it was DC 9 volt this symbol right here means DC but the nice thing is right here it says that the uh, power consumption is only 7.7 .7 watts so in fact our 10 watt adapter uh, should be perfectly fine to run this this doesn't use as much current as uh, some of the other keyboards that I've seen this also is capable of being run off of six flashlight batteries D size batteries that would go right here the door's missing I'm not too worried about that though we're never gonna run this thing off of batteries Somebody's had this apart before. There's two screws missing. I don't need to take all of these screws off for this uh, bottom plate right here. All right. Well, looks like we uh, lucked out here, and this is going to be probably a easy repair. Um, what we're looking at here is we're looking at the uh, underside or the backside of the printed circuit board and uh, these light green areas that you see right here are actually what they call the copper traces so it's actually a thin film of copper uh, the way this board is actually made is it's coated with a, a thin film of copper and then there's through a special process the copper is etched away wherever they do not want conductivity so what you're left with is this whole uh, path of little copper strips that actually act as wires to connect points, uh, components from point to point. So you can have all these different components being connected together in a very small space instead of having to have individual wires running all over the place. So um, then what they do is they coat the board with a protective covering. So that's why these aren't copper colored. Uh, they're green, uh, not from corrosion or aging of the copper, but from an actual, uh, uh, like an, a resin type product that they put on there. But all the components are inserted from the other side of the board on this particular model, uh, with the exception of one uh, semiconductor, one large scale uh, microprocessor over here, which I'll show you in a moment. But the components are inserted through holes in the board, and then the connections on the component are soldered to the traces on this side of the board. So all of these are solder connections. Well, right here, where this 
ugly messes right here in the corner. Um, this, these three pins, there's actually three pins here. There's one here, one here, and one here. These three pins are where that little jack that the DC plug on the back here, okay, plugs into. And what happens is, over time, from plugging it in and unplugging it and having it, you know, sometimes get smacked around, uh, this gets wiggled around. What can happen is the connector can actually break free of its connections. So I don't know if you can see that. Hopefully you can see that. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty even. You can actually see this moving. And this one here is also broken free. And that one doesn't look so great either. So these points right here on that connector are no longer making contact with these uh, PC runs, these little copper traces. So what we've got to do is we've got to remove the solder, uh, see how the trace is damaged, and see if we can repair it and resolder it in, and that might repair it. Uh, if you're wondering why there are three connections here, you would think there'd only be two, you know, one for positive and one for negative. The reason why there's a third connection here is because this jack actually does a second job. It actually also acts as a switch. And the way that it acts as a switch is when, when a plug is plugged into the back of this, uh, only two of these points will have the uh, positive and negative uh, connection made, and they'll supply DC voltage from, from the AC adapter, uh, converted to DC, right to the unit. What happens when you unplug this plug is the positive connection that's supposed to be supplying voltage to the circuit becomes connected to one of these other pins, probably this one, okay and that will run over to the battery pack okay so if we actually look so these two wires right here the red and black wires are going down to that battery pack and this is the uh, positive lead right here and it goes to a little jumper right there and it goes to this trace which i could follow right over to right to that pin i was just talking about so the reason why they do it that way is because if you have batteries installed in the unit, um, you know, regular flashlight batteries are in there, alkaline batteries, and then uh, if they didn't have this switching, what could happen is somebody could come along and plug in an adapter, not realizing that there are batteries in the unit. And the danger would be that now you have the DC voltage of the power supply uh, is now directly across the battery pack. and regular alkaline batteries aren't designed to be charged so if you apply a voltage to them they can actually heat up so that's not a good idea so that's why there's this little bit of isolation built into it all right so I'm gonna get my uh, soldering gear fired up over here and we're gonna clean this all up and uh, we'll fix this I removed all the screws that hold this PC board in and uh, I'm not gonna unsolder these wires so I can't flip the board over uh, all the way because of the speaker wire here but the main reason i just lifted this out is because it's going to give me easier access to the edge of this board here i don't want to be reaching down in there with the soldering iron trying to trying to work at that uh, with solder wick to to remove the solder and everything i'm going to end up just burning that plastic and making a mess so by uh by just lifting it up this much here on the edge here it's going to give me a uh, uh, much better access and uh, i did say i was going to show you this is the only component that's uh soldered to this side of the board and this is what's called a surface mount component um, the reason why is because these tiny leads on this semiconductor which uh, by the looks of it is a large microprocessor they all um do not go through holes in the board where the solder on the other side this actually sits on top of the the traces and is soldered right to the trace right on top and uh, typically there's something underneath there that actually some sort of a glue that would have kept that in position um, and it's tricky to unsolder this type of component it's not something you can do with you know a regular soldering iron uh, successfully at least that's been my experience fortunately for me it's highly doubtful that this uh, component is bad so this is a uh, solder pult or a solder sucker and uh, what this does is this has got a, uh, a little piston inside of the cylinder here it's got a little tip and uh, almost like a syringe tip spring-loaded 
and you cock it by pushing this down and then when I push this button this will pop up and it'll rapidly pull that piston up and it'll create a vacuum here at the nozzle tip and all you do is get the solder molten to a molten state and I just sucked up a big ball of solder and then to clear the uh, to clear the unit you just go like that and there we go that's how much solder I just pulled out of there so I also use a product like this this is a copper braid in the trade known as solder wick and what it does is it as you apply it and you heat it up it will wick up the solder that stuff is more expensive than just using one of these over and over again but this doesn't tend to clean up as well so what I tend to do is I'll uh, I'll get the heavy stuff up with with the solder bolt and then I'll uh, come back and I'll just do a final cleanup with the solder wick Ah, uh, I gotta grab my reading glasses. All right, so I'm not really that surprised to see that this lead right here has the remnants of some of that copper trace attached to it that is broken off of the rest of the copper trace. So this little piece right here is actually just barely hold, holding on to this lead, but more importantly, I wiggle a lead I can see that it's completely cracked free of the rest of this so that's gonna be a problem because there's not much this black area you see right around here is where the trace used to be and is gone because it just basically went with the solder as I sucked it up so I could actually take even that little last piece off and it'll just be completely this pin will be completely isolated from the remnants of the copper trace around it so we've got to come up with something to alleviate that. And I think the best fix is going to be to find a, a way to uh, secure this pin back into the trace. And I think what we'll do is we'll scrape back this protective coating and we'll expose copper over here. And we'll lay in a little piece of copper wire that will wrap around this pin and be soldered to this point right here. This one, other than just needing to be resoldered, actually looks okay. And this one here also looks okay, and we're not even that concerned about it because that's for the battery. The starters, I think I'll uh, reflow these two good connections. So the way I want to do this is I want to actually heat the uh, the trace and more importantly the lead that goes into the connector because that's going to absorb the most heat. And I'm going to get that hot enough and then I'm going to bring the solder in on the other side and let the solder flow into the whole connection. Could use a little bit more on that one with the battery post. And again, I'm not so concerned about the being able to use this on battery, but the reason why I still want that connection to be pretty uh, robust is because it does help absorb some of the force, the flexing force that's put on this thing when the plug is being plugged in and the thing's being abused. That's better. All right, now I've got to get a sharp, small tool so I can scrape away at that um, protective coating. And just as I suspected, just the uh, act of trying to scrape off this um, coating actually tore away what was left of that pad that had broken free. So you can see this is all, this dark area all around the pin is just raw board. There's no copper on it. So this pin now is completely isolated from the copper, the remains of the copper run around it. There's really nothing much left there to attach to. So what we're going to do is I scraped away over here at this area, okay, and we're going to uh, put a piece of wire that's going to just lay here and wrap around this pin and flow solder over the whole mess. All right, I forgot to hit the record button, uh, but I just wrapped a piece of uh, copper braided wire that I cut a really small piece I wrapped it around here and then left a little tail and I flowed solder all through that 
to the uh, actual lug of the connector itself and then also to what's left of the uh, pad here and then all along where I sh scrape back so it's a little tricky because I've got a point right here where this trace is transferred over to this side through a jumper right there and you can see the jumper soldered there and there so what I've got to do is I've got to make sure that I don't have a uh, connection that I haven't accidentally bridged this I looked at it under magnification it looks pretty good but I'll just check real quick with the meter make sure I don't have any shorts between here and either one of these points I think that's just a piece of wire anyways I don't think it's a resistor but I'll just check that real quick and then uh, if that's clear we'll uh, we'll test it all right I haven't screwed this all back together yet um, but I did put the uh, screws in the PC board so I'm just gonna plug the power supply in and voila we've got our LED and we've got our 000 up here the multifunction display is lit demo mode on here somewhere. I don't know how to use half the features on this thing and I'm not going to worry about it. The point is that the uh, unit is repaired. I can turn it over to the kids and uh, well, they can break it. Or, uh, well, let's see. I wonder what will happen first. Will they get bored of it and stop using it or break it? <laughs> or will they become so interested in the keyboard that they will start to apply themselves and become virtuosos? All right. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Take care. Oh, yeah. And because my son always tells me I forget, please hit the subscribe and like buttons.